is the guy I've had lots of interaction with, and uh, Dave Morehouse had previously been a VP at Motorola. So these, you know, doing like chips and stuff like that. These guys know what they're doing. They go way back into the sort of the early days of the game industry, and uh, uh, you know, kind of lots of sort of consumer, I guess, uh, great systems. They have a business model that both sells these packaged units. When I, when I sort of first went looking for this stuff, I was basically looking for low cost, quiet, uh, power efficient, but capable system that, that also ran something familiar that you could program. In this case, it's, it's Ubuntu. Uh, I've also toyed around with Android running on it, which they now have actually posted on their website as a preview. And Fedora, Fedora folks here? Fedora folks, Fedora folks. There supposedly is a, a developer. Uh, uh, either or both. Uh, Enthusiasts, uh, but there's another sort of port underway. Currently, the Ubuntu port is the main port. So, so uh, the other challenge was, uh, you know, how do you find just like a version of Ubuntu that runs on an ARM pro uh, on an ARM system? Where do you find an ARM system to begin with, right? And they virtually don't exist. I mean, the Beagle board, right? How many people use the Beagle board? And uh, nobody's used the Beagle board. So a few of us have them, right? Kurt, uh, uh, Shiva plugs. Okay, so a couple of you Shiva plugs. Same sort of idea, right? It's a it's an ARM-based processor. In the case of the Shiva plug, it's made by Marvell, low cost, 99 bucks. Um, the thing is beautiful about these systems is they have a couple of USB ports. Things like Shiva plug don't, they may or may not, right? Uh, they have got Ethernet. Shiva plug may or may not. Shiva plug may have two actually, but it, it, they may or may not. Um, it's got built-in Wi-Fi which variants of the Shiva plug may or may not have, uh, but this one works beautifully. So you get Wi-Fi, you get Ethernet, you get a couple of USB ports, uh, you get a built-in SSD, so it's a solid state drive, some memory, you know, probably not enough memory compared to what you might be familiar with on your Windows machine, but uh, more than enough memory if you actually want to do useful things. And so, so it's, that's kind of the package that you get. And then you have to add to it, what, keyboard, mouse, monitor, some kind of display mechanism, at which we'll actually work on uh, getting going here. So that's the other thing that's pretty interesting. And, and if you have quite, oh, uh, so first off, for people who are online, there's, if you go to Twitter, uh, I just kind of put in a plug for um, a hashtag of, what did I call it, uh, hash smart talk. So if maybe somebody could go there just to humor me at least and add in a couple of questions about what you'd be interested in in terms of addressing this during this presentation. There may or may not be somebody from Genesee on the other side of the country. I have a couple of, uh, well, if you have an opportunity. Sure. Uh, applications for it, like some examples of what one might be able to use this for. Right. So uh, for instance, and if, if I get this thing actually fired up, if not during the allotted time, certainly by uh, the end of the evening, my particular application was like a, um, a video surveillance and security application. So what I wanted was a couple of things. One is uh, something that actually could run in kind of uh, a, a small space that wouldn't generate lots of heat or noise, or um, but that could actually have server capabilities that would do the wireless stuff. So uh, for me, that's that's you know it's it basically it's it's a web server. Anybody who wants a home control system that could be used for like a media. It's another thing that is commonly used for Shiva plugs, which are these, uh, you know, kind of these media management systems. You could do the same thing, right? So basically, if you think about it, anything that you could do on an Ubuntu system that doesn't require a gobs of RAM on, you know, on the machine or terabytes of storage built into the machine, you could do with this. The beauty of this is that with the uh, USB, you can just, you know, you can load up cheap terabytes of storage and, and uh, work with that. So the, what I've got here is I've got a couple of video cameras that are wireless cameras and also a USB webcam. And so what the application is that I developed, uh, it, it grabs images periodically from things like these wireless IP cameras that are just sort of, you know, sent either over Ethernet or over the air. And also it pulls the USB port for uh, the, the webcam grabs images and posts them. So it's a, it's a useful little application from my perspective. And uh, there are others that people can, I mean, there are people here who are interested, obviously. So, um, I, I mean, for instance, I know, not without revealing any specifics, but I mean, anybody taking the bolt bus down to New York or back? 
you know, it's got like Wi-Fi, right? And some people might figure out, geez, how do you get like Wi-Fi to that? And some people actually might have answers. So anything that's kind of, I, I look at these as uh, actually uh, a different class. There's kind of like desktop applications, there are web applications, there are mobile applications. I kind of look at it as relocatable applications. So any place where you want to sort of pick up a system and go, it could be disaster relief, it could be kind of an emergency response type of system, it could be sporting events, event management. Um, so those are a few of the, the, and the ideas that I've seen. Obviously, it's the kind of thing, yes. Uh, it does audio. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I mean, the one thing you will see is that, you know, it does audio. Is it going to, anybody named Bose in the building? You know, it is, it, it's just, it's not going to rival. No Bose. But it is, you know, it's not going to rival uh, that. The other thing is that it's, it's, you know, not optimally suited for at this stage of the game is video, uh, you know, sort of. So if, if you have, like, if you want to do a media center uh, to, and you want to drive it with a system like this, it's, you know, the processor just doesn't have enough oomph to it, right? So there are certainly a class of applications that are not uh, suitable or appropriate for it. Uh, the flip side of it is that, um, and I don't know how many people use Atom processors, like, you know, a handful, small number. So I, I, I've used the, those a lot, and I'm a big fan of them because you really get a fair amount of, uh, of processing power for a low price. And, of course, they've just recently introduced, what is it? Is it Oak Trail? It's, I think it's the Oak Trail release of there. Uh, so lower power, but still with the x86 instruction set. So when you get the x86 instruction set of uh, the Atom, of course, you, you avoid a lot of the sort of potential issues of dealing with the ARM. So the, the way this stuff works, for, everybody probably knows this, but you know, you get the processor, and then you get a uh, port Linux to it. And on top of Linux, you got to put all the related sort of accessory utilities and, uh, and, and stuff like that. And you keep going up the application hierarchy and eventually get to applications. And some applications may or may not work, right? And, you know, and pretty much everything works on x86. So, uh, so you may get to a level of your application stack where, in fact, things haven't been properly ported to ARM. It's been a real effort for the Ubuntu folks to make that happen. And for, you know, for the core application stuff, I put together some slides, which I'll probably just post uh, afterwards. But you know, it, the open office stuff works, runs fine. Basically, anything that comes with a standard Ubuntu distribution will be adequate for the moment. Web browsers work great. Uh, the Chromium browser works. You know, it, it comes with Mozilla's Firefox installed default. Um, I install Chromium. <coughs> works great. I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah, my question has nothing to do with this, but I noticed that on uh, Fedora, they have the Chrome browser. And on Ubuntu, they have the Chromium browser. browser. Uh, so, uh, you know, so I mean, straight out, it's the Chromium a is a, a fit is a uh, beta version of that because Chrome is the official. Right. So, uh, so the the terminology is uh, uh, Chromium is the open source yeah. version of it. Chrome is Google's version of it. Google's the primary. Uh, developer of the code base, which actually is built on top of WebKit, which actually Apple was originally the primary developer of for like the presentation stuff. So you know, so Google basically takes it and they work on their code and their any Chromium browser, any Chromium developers in the group. Not a developer, but basically <coughs> what you're looking at is Chrome and Chromium. Their boot uh, process is yep. actually a hack. So if you edit anything on the machine itself, it won't boot just won't work. So what Chromium allows you to do is basically set up a local server for it to check its hash against. So you can actually make it so that this is basically a web device that will not boot unless it can authenticate itself to a local server. Same thing with Chrome, except for Chrome uses Google. But that's the big difference. Okay, thanks. So, so why Fedora has Chrome and um, you know some of the other distros don't know? Completely sure, but 
Okay, so here's the first thing that you notice with this system, right? And this is the future, so I think we all got to get used to it. So it's HDMI based. The, the, uh, the thing about the uh, atom boards, which you can buy from Newegg, which are 85 bucks, and I get you know more than I can use, but they're great little boards, and they give you. And John's going to try and plug this in, I hope, to a video device that might actually project something on the screen. Um, Let's check the panel over here. Or anyone who's got. Uh, we're going to try this anyways. So this comes with HDMI built in, right? So most mm -hmm. things people have, it's either. Uh, VGA, which is what the Atom board comes standard with, and actually they don't give you the DVI for higher video quality, which presumably is reflecting the limitations in the, in the processor, I presume, but also they want you to buy more expensive boards that have higher capability video. Anyways, the uh, new Atom Oak Trail uh, CPU has built-in support for HDMI, so I'm just speculating. But no HDMI on this, just uh, S video. And but I have a DVI. Yeah. Is there a DVI? We don't have DVI to be J converter. Well, then the same DVI to be a DVI. Okay. So this monitor takes the HDMI or VJ, but it doesn't take DVI. All right. Okay. So what we'll do afterwards, I'll set up. I have an HDMI TV. John's got HDMI here, and we'll just plug it in just to kind of show you the. Yeah, uh, one more, this is a really cheap yeah. monitor. Yeah. And when I get the desktop here, the <coughs> yeah. sort of border all around is not visible on the screen. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, uh, with that encouraging note, we'll just keep moving along. What? And you got a border top and bottom or all the way around? So I, I guess it was intended more as a TV than as a monitor. Yeah, so, so it's like probably 780 seven instead of yeah. 768. That's okay. It's, it's not a problem. We, we uh, I'll at least put it on to... Uh, an HDMI TV. So here's what we're doing. HDMI plug, uh, thanks to Kurt, courtesy of Kurt. You really need like a USB hub for these things. They only, hit, well, depending upon your applications, uh, they have two USB, it has two USB ports. And so for this, for my application, I use a hub, I plug in a USB mouse, a USB uh, keyboard. Uh, do people know if they have a USB keyboard or uh, a, 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 the old style? What is it? P PS2. PS2. Do you, do you know? It's really hard to tell when you buy these things on Amazon because they, they kind of hide what the, <laughs> what the tail is, you know? So you almost have to uh, take your chances. But for these, you need to make sure that you get uh, USB d devices because that's, that's what it works on. The other thing that's really nice about <coughs> this uh, device is that it's got a built-in SD slot. And the beauty of the built-in SD slot is is a couplefold. One is that it's a quick, cheap way to amplify, you know, storage without carrying around lots of luggable things that need to be plugged in. Okay, so you don't need to plug in your uh, SD storage. The other thing is that this device is just terrific, and this is where it kind of knocks the socks off, in my experience, the other low-power ARM processor devices that I've had an opportunity to work with, principally BeagleBoard and the Shiva Plug. And that's this, that you can load a system onto this SD card, you can pop it into the uh, device, and it will boot off of it. And not only will it boot off of it, but it's a very simple process to reinstall off of it. So if, if I can reinstall the system off of it, virtually anybody else who's familiar with Linux can do the same. So what you're able to do is basically download an image to this SD card, and have people boot it off of USB? devices using Ubuntu, showing hands like a third or so. You know, routinely people do it off of CD uh, devices, but um, it's extremely easy with this. With and, and you're basically working with a pre-built ISO image of what the whole system is. And then after you've got the system, it, it comes, all the systems that we have here today, they're installed and they get the latest stuff that you know, I updated the NASA up like yesterday. But um, it's very simple to use the update manager to pull down the usual stuff using, you know, app get and those things that, how many people use Ubuntu? Just a quick show of hands. So about okay. half versus uh, two thirds. Okay. Uh, so, so again, the beauty of it is that, that uh, they come with these, that you get these SD cards. You, you can use them as storage, you can boot off of them, and you can use them as an installation, okay? The other thing that's quite remarkable and, um, and generous on the part of the Genesee folks is actually these come with an SD card inside of it, which is these guys are definitely not making money on anybody who buys these. So uh, make sure to say thank you to them. The other thing that it comes with actually is a developer. Uh, people know what JTAG 
is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so so but basically it's like it's a way to send serial commands from a console terminal program to uh, one of these devices. It's a way to kind of get under the covers and do a little stuff, particularly when you get hosed and you're really desperate, right? Uh, with some of the other devices, the, the, particularly the BeagleBoard and Shiva Plug, from my experience as of three to six months ago, it was like the only way to get under the covers. So with this, it's simply uh, kind of an extra. I actually haven't had to use it since like the first pre-release builds to, to do anything. But it's kind of cool that if you wanted to, you could actually get in. There's a little slot here. You can pop it open. There's a little sticker that says "Voice the Warranty" and you know all that kind of good stuff. But uh, at any rate, it doesn't do any harm. You plug it in. You bring up a serial terminal, a, a terminal program, and you can just start communicating at a very low level as a serial. Any questions on that? We won't demo it, but again, each of these boxes that we have has one of those JTAG things in the box. So it's a UART. It's not a like a Direct JTAG. Yep. Because with JTAG, you, you usually get a debugger. It's, it's uh, you know, I actually don't know the, the, the sort of underlying. There actually is on, on the uh, website, uh, you, you know, you can sort of get a look at how the thing is constructed. And it's got a bit of a. Got one of them right here. Oh, John's got one. So. Is that the. Um, the uh, RS422 uh, connector, and then the uh, little cable here that plugs into that uh, oh, the thing you take off the back. Okay. So those are actually handy uh, from a kind of an experimenter's standpoint. You can do a little bit of, of work. Let's see if I can break this now. Uh, that's the other thing uh, that, you know, these days you can buy uh, HDMI TVs for less than what you used to be able to buy decent um, displays for. So for like, I'm not sure what I got this for, but I'm sure it was under $200 from Costco. And yeah. and it's good for Celtics games too. So some assembly required. However. Um, okay, so we're kind of literally putting this thing together. Do people have HDMI screens in their Residences or no. offices. <laughs> They're pretty common. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite Question. sure what the difference between um, PVI and HDMI in terms of what the plug looks like. HDMI sort of looks like an HDMI plug. Uh, looks like an HD15 that got flat run over. <laughs> Flattened out. <laughs> Yeah, this is the, uh, that's what I got. Yeah. This is the standard. Yeah. HDMI looks like a great big USB. Yeah, HDMI looks like a great, great big USB. That's pretty much it. There's, I mean, basically, I don't think there's a tremendous amount, I'm not a video guy, but I don't think there's a tremendous amount in terms of the fidelity or integrity of the image, but, you know, there probably are differences in the royalties streams that get paid. Do we have some place to plug this? Any other questions? You can get, um, which is another notable difference in, in just a year's time or so, you can, for like about 10 bucks, you can get an HDMI to a DVI uh, converter. So if you've got a DVI cable, uh, or a DVI monitor display. You don't have to run out and get an HDMI thing. And it works reasonably good. So, uh, you know, and again, Amazon Basics, and you'll have it <coughs> kind of by the weekend without too much trouble. Um, so what we've done here is we don't actually have network access, and that's but that's okay. Um, but with a little bit of luck, we'll... Oh, you should be able to go up to the MIT wireless. Uh, oh, actually, that's a great idea, John. Thank you. That's good. Um, these things, pretty cool. I don't know if people have seen these. Absolutely. Kilowatt, you know, for 20 bucks. It, it's, uh, I don't know if it was Kurt or Steven or somebody who introduced me to it, but 20, 25 bucks, and you can measure all sorts of things, amperage and wattage, and when it's time to get a new refrigerator and things like that. Uh, what do we got there? Okay, we got something. So, question? No signal. Uh, one thing that this actually d does, depending upon how you look at it, um, 
I mean, they, they do lots of, I think, nice power management where it just kind of shuts things down quietly and peacefully. And I've actually had remarkably good success in using it. I mean, it hasn't been a typical uh, nightmare of stuff works one day and doesn't work the next. It, it, they've kind of hammered out the, 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 uh, the major bugs at this point. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, I guess I'll do one more thing. I'll just add in a webcam. Another thing that can be handy on occasion of these uh, USB extenders, people probably seen them, but you know, for like a couple of bucks, you can get an extra nine or ten feet um, out of your USB. So here's just the straightforward uh, webcam kind of thing. You know, they come in 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 different flavors and size and costs, and that's another thing that has changed a whole lot. You know, you can get these anywhere from about ten bucks. You know, I've even gotten them for six bucks, like on Amazon, up to about seventy or eighty or a hundred. Of course, it, and a lot of it is the quality. But actually, the other thing is these are all—they're basically like HD uh, images right now. So for under a hundred bucks, for around fifty bucks, you can essentially get HD images out of a webcam, and it's incredibly good. Okay. Mm -hmm. The uh, one thing that's important is some of the older webcams—they—they uh, they don't. Uh, Linux has built in—is it UVC support? Anybody know about this stuff? So uh, basically what's happened over the past year is that there's been a standard that's developed for video transfer within Linux. The newer uh, kernels have it built in. Two years ago, it used to be just a mess. You know, you were lucky if any webcams worked. Uh, a year ago, uh, more and more webcams worked. Logitech, I think, basically took the lead in this. And they were the ones who sort of established the standards. And now there's a very uh, well-organized so, sort of developer community around ensuring that the webcams work with Linux. So there's a wide selection of webcams that you can now use with Linux. So for instance, another application, which uh, I, I guess I'd almost characterize as the, as the grandparent application. It's kind of like the, the, you know, sort of a dedicated Skype terminal for somebody who is, or a dedicated international terminal. That's the other thing, seven watts, I mean, I love to turn things off, and this system's actually good at shutting itself down. But these are now systems you can just run all the time. They're not producing heat, they're not producing noise, so there are lots of things that you can start to do with it. So another application that would be kind of cool would be, uh, you know, just kind of like a Skype, a Skype booth, where you could set up your own thing. All right, so we're gonna kind of press a button here, and uh, see what I forgot to plug in. <laughs> I'm sure it was something. It probably has to do with turning on the power. Nope, that turned it off. That turned it off. Okay, so it wasn't that good. You got me. Let's just, it's kind of like fishing. Right? I just kind of go and see what's at the end of the line here. And there we go. Plug that in. So that always helps. It's uh, not battery powered. Although this one is. And it's pretty cool. I, I guess I'll just show it. show it to you. So, so here, you know, it just comes with the usual, like, login screens and all the usual. There aren't any shortcuts that, from what I can tell, taken. the only shortcut they've taken actually has greatly simplified the Ubuntu installation process, in my opinion. So once you get through the common installation of all the core files, they kind of have whittled down the next series of time zone, name, and, you know, password to, like, about four screens. Goes quickly, not a big hassle. Um, <coughs> So, it, so that's pretty much how quickly it, it booted up and, and uh, or jumped into. So what I'll do is I'll just, let me just do a quick check here. I want to check on something that, uh, you know, all the, all the Google stuff works, works pretty fine. So, uh, this, you know, all the web browser stuff works fine. You don't have any problems with that. Okay, so we got things plugged in. We got no signal again, which is a good sign. We got a blue light here. Uh, so it's coming up. At some point, we might actually see something here. Might not. Green light. Don't know what you see, but I see green light. So that's got to be a good sign. Um, that's so boom! There you go. They actually have a nicely designed logo. I know. A little round of applause for this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it actually is pretty well done. And it, it comes up. From what it's on this one. It's a newer release. You may have, like, you know, I gave it to you, John. I mean, you can, it's kind of like. You can't, no, but so the beauty of it is they probably do. I get, we got a couple early that were pre-release and shoved them out the door. 
And uh, but again, and then they finalize the software and some of the things that. So you actually heard a little bit of audio in the background. Um, it does play, you know, actually audio files reasonably well. Um, the video is kind of, you know, a little bit more work. But what I'm going to do, because I can't really see, but I will. Uh, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to. What I'm not going to do is because it's just I don't have enough room. But I'll explain to you what I did do. I, I just wrote, wrote very simple kind of hello world programs in, in C, Python, Ruby, uh, Haskell, Scala, Java, and there might have been one or two others that I, that I tried along the way, right? So for any, in my view, that's another great application for this kind of a system, which is educational applications. So for somebody who would like to learn a programming language, for instance, right? So uh, there are these guys down at Princeton. Who's the guy that's done all the books on algorithms? Sedgwick, right? So he's got like, he's got a gazillion books on all sorts of stuff. He's got a great book which he co-authored with another guy on Java. And so you may be pro or con Java. For a long time I was con, uh, but it's an excellent introduction, not only to a language, Java, but also to programming. But then the question is, you know, to do Java like on uh, $2,000 kind of Windows machine or even a $2,000 you know Linux machine or any kind of $2,000 machine is almost kind of a waste with something like, and, and also it's not accessible <coughs> to people in, in lots of corners of the world right so so when it was with this uh, you know I ran through those programs they all compiled and ran fine they did the basic stuff certainly when you get to a point where you have uh, and intensive graphic interfaces and all. you know it, this is not the kind of thing that you're going to build uh, uh, you know Amazon's website on right on the other hand for somebody who would like to do introductory programming or outreach to uh, to distant communities great great uh, platform so all the stuff that is you know true Ubuntu it'll run Pick your, pick your language of choice. But I did those half dozen, and it, it worked well. It didn't compile as, you know, as, far, as fast as a quad core, you know, three gigahertz machine that you've got. But, you know, that's okay. Not everybody's in a big rush. It's probably not as good from a graphical user interface of having, uh, you know, an Eclipse IDE running. Not a good idea, I suspect. But uh, at the very least, you could uh, have an IDE on a um, uh, powerful machine and... Uh, and cross compile down to an arm. Right. So which which is, as I understand it at least, the primary way that people who are really doing the ports of this stuff they, they work. You know, they get cross compiling tools and all that kind of stuff. All I'm gonna do here in in the background is uh, looking up upside down at it, is just launch a you know, so this kind of stuff looks pretty familiar. Oh I gotta admit I don't usually look at it upside down, but like doing something in the mirror. Yeah. It's just to say impossible. Maybe if you use the arrow keys instead, it would be easier. What's that? If you use the arrow keys instead, it might be easier. You know, do you, can you use the arrow keys? Yeah. All right, let's try that. So if you hit return, oh, you can use, yeah, that's cool. Good, thank you very much for that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just launch the terminal, okay? And, and this is only to show a demonstration of, um, uh, you know how you can actually do reasonably uh, decent stuff. I think with this kind of a platform. So I'm just changing to a directory where I've got the software that I developed, which I call Octoput, and um, we'll go back. You know, you do all the usual up down stuff. Arrows. It has the same uh, the same sort of history trail that you get, and then I'm just gonna run this program. And then I'll kind of explain to you, generally speaking, what it does, okay? So what it's doing now is it's launching a number of different tasks within Python. And at some point, you may even see, like, a, you know, a view of the ceiling or something like that. And so, so there it is. So that nobody feels particularly sensitive that they're, like, on, uh, on camera. But we can do a quick flash, and, you know, there you go. Can look at this through our web browsers? Uh, my goodness, you could actually, and so, so, so you could. Um, so what we do here is we look and find out what IP address it got when it booted up, and uh, 
Okay, so the um, starting, uh, it, uh, sorry, but it, for some reason it didn't pick up an IP address, which I guess would be because I didn't access it. Uh, yeah, this, this wouldn't pick it up automatically either. I had to go to the network settings and actually type in the ESSID before it worked. Anyway. So what we'll do is we'll we'll do that, okay? So the steps that I, I, I need to do and then explain it and then, you know, we'll give you a URL and watch the thing die. Um, but, so what I should have done, what I need to do is just simply, just like you do with Ubuntu, you go up to the little icon, the upper right hand corner, you pick um, a Wi-Fi access point, right? And you log in, and if it's open, it's, you know, you're in. If it's not, you're, uh, you know, your little keyword, and you're in, okay? So then the thing has uh, an IP address, and then when you start this software that I just, you know, kind of got running, it would automatically pick up an IP address it's got, a, it's got a DHCP address. It's one of the tasks that it's launched is uh, a web server, actually all written in Python that you know is out there. And, uh, and then another task that it launched is essentially uh, talking to all, it goes out and it sniffs the network for other like-minded, does a little handshake with, you know, it finds an address and it says, talk to me, and if you get the right code, then bing, you must be another, what I refer to as occupant. It's like the occipital load. Anybody know what, you know, vision stuff. But um, it, then it, it, so it's at the same time that it is talking to any other servers that are out there, periodically updating them, every few seconds, actually. It's also um, responding to any web browsers that come in that are, again, could be pinging it every few seconds, right? So you've got those tasks going. At the same time, it periodically is doing a couple things. One is writing images to, um, to, to the files. This is where you start to get the little, uh, the other thing that it's, it's got a little background task that's doing motion detection, okay? So anybody know what OpenCV is? I know Kurt mm -hmm. does, but, You know, so OpenCV is this thing that they used in the DARPA buggy out at Stanford to do the vision, computer vision stuff. It's really cool. Uh, there's, uh, it's all written, I think, in C++, but it's been ported to the ARM platform. And there's a very nice Python interface to it. So, but it's the, the computational uh, effort behind doing some of this image comparison is a, is fairly you know heavyweight. So, uh, you know I kind of get that turned off right now on this platform. I'm sure that you know with a little bit of tuning on my part and a little faster processor on on their part, um, that, that stuff would work. In terms of going forward, they already sort of have given a sense at some point in the future, and it's really easy if you look at Freescale. Oh, Freescale. Is Freescale is the the company that it kind of was a spin out from Motorola back in the good old days. <coughs> and they make these ARM chips, which I guess they're probably using phones at some point. Uh, th they've got future CPUs just like everybody does that are faster, better, cheaper, hopefully cheaper, um, and could do probably more of that kind of heavy duty processing. So, so the idea here is that you can certainly do, still running, there's like no blue screens of, you don't really get a blue screen of death, but. Um, but you do get, you know, you can kind of, and what you'll see eventually is that every few seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, I don't quite know how I've got this thing set up, but uh, it will sort of catch up and it will say, okay, different image that will get processed. And then it stores the, the images, I won't show them here, so it just picked it up now, right? So this is the kind of thing where um, there's just all sorts of uh, <coughs> presets in here where you can say, Check this camera every five seconds, every 10 seconds, every 30 minutes. Um, you can do check this camera on motion detected, right? And so not to get into that end of things, but uh, it's sort of an interesting area to do some work. So basically what, for my application, I wanted something that was low cost, uh, that was quiet, that was easy to work with and familiar, uh, in a, with a familiar tool chain, meaning Ubuntu and some language that would work. Um, and so I had actually developed this thing all on, you know, bigger systems, and then I, the first time I ran it on this, on this box, everything just worked. I mean, it was really pretty, pretty amazing that um, the first time I just took all the Python files, of which there probably are 50 or so, I mean, so it's not, it's not like a gigantic code base, but there's lots of stuff that could go wrong. And uh, I had to install FFmpeg. People know kind of what that is, right? Mm -hmm. And that all just, you know, installed fine. I had to install OpenCV. That all installed fine. <coughs> and uh, 
I don't know if there's really much else at, at that point. The one thing I'd like to do, and this is sort of a test of how the ARM platform works, is move the video capture to WebM, which is the open standard format that Google and others have been an advocate of for a couple of reasons. One is it is truly open source and all these other things really seem encumbered it's in, in some way by different uh, patents or royalties. And two is it's, it, from what I can tell, extremely efficient at compressing stuff. And uh, three, the fidelity is just, the, the quality is quite good. So, so that's it. Um, I'll kind of step back and questions <coughs> for anybody who's got questions about, either about the smart pop, which is the desktop unit, or the mm -hmm. smart book, which is the, yeah. I have two questions. The smart pop, does it have any kind of storage built into it? It does, and somebody will have to uh, check the specs. I mean, I think it's got, is it a half a gig of RAM? or yeah. 512. 512. 512 makes RAM and 8 gigs SSD. And 8 gigs SSD. How much does it cost on a laptop or a netbook? 199. Is it like 199? 199. They, they had a price change. Um, actually, I'd, I'll take some credit for it. They, the price change after, uh, you know, I talked to them, and I said, you know, look, there's like a magic. I think there's a magic point here where you get to at a hundred bucks that these are just like, you know, sticks of gum. And it's just, which I actually haven't worked with the gum sticks, but Kurt has. But how much do they cost? Well, it's, so they're, they're more than they're more than 150. The Panda board is 150. So that's kind of my, uh, you know, if, if they can get down, down to like Panda board price, then, then they'll. So I think what the price used to be on the smart top, like just three months ago when we booked this thing, was 250 or something like that. And they then subsequently lowered the price actually to, I think officially it's 129. Um, I don't think that necessarily includes the SD card, and it certainly doesn't include the developer uh, little dongle thing, that whether it's a UART or a JTAG, I'm not quite sure. But uh, they told me as they were not to a plane today, 100 bucks for anybody who wants one tonight will, you know, we'll arrange it. So we got we got rid of. I have one spare. We got rid of the others. People picked them up for. Uh, we got a priority for cash. Yeah, cash is definitely a priority. <laughs> so. uh, I got uh, cash in my pocket. Right there you now. go. All right. Well, so the Bruins are in season, so we got to get him out of here to see. I'll raise you five. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I guess you know it's it's yeah, cash. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's so. Anyways, well, I think probably the easiest way, Jerry. Sign one for when you can get one. Okay, so um, if it's okay with people, I think because for people who signed in, did I give like name and email address? For the most part, I didn't yeah. sign in. So, so I think if you're interested, probably because Jerry's got a good list: name, email, address, and you know if you're definitely interested, and then I will get back to you with the you know the secret code to send to to the folks at Genesee. They're really good. It's not a huge company, but uh, they know what they're doing. One of the other things that I didn't really detail is w one of the, their business model moving forward is they're actually going to uh, sell these as kits, not in the next week or next month, but with the next rev. So that the students could essentially get a kit part, they could assemble it themselves, and th they'd be off and running. And it's a kit part not at the level of got to solder all uh, oh. you know, capacitors and and, and uh, service mounted mm -hmm. chips. It's basically, it's kind of like a motherboard case. You know, it's really at the higher level of, and if you can get it for a considerably lower price, everybody's What, what are they planning price wise for that? That I don't know, that I don't know. But, but uh, the other thing is obviously they're interested in, uh, you know, I think it, they're comfortable selling these in larger numbers as well as, they kind of did a special deal for us. I'll do pre development on the smart book. Um, what storage is in it, and what expansion possibilities does it have? I, I think, and again, somebody will have to check the, maybe the website for another matter. Right now. It says that it's um, 800 megahertz processor, 16 gig solid state drive, with 512 megs of RAM, but it doesn't say what the upgrade capacity is. Mm -hmm. So, the, the uh, and the price is what does it say? Is it it's 199? It's 199. So, um, I mean, I'll pass it around. It, it's, it's actually, not, it's light. It, I, you know, the thing is, Wait till I've got it I wouldn't, I've got you know, it's not. <laughs> 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 you, got it. you, you bought it. You see where we can get it there, right? It's very small. Large, like, I don't know, 10, 20 people order. Of the smart tops, the smart phones? Yeah, smart. I, you know, if, if, if uh, 10 is a magic number, 
Well, at least it was for Smart Tops because they sell me they ship in a box. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not too ashamed to ask. Uh, um, one thing to think about with the, the Smart Book in terms of expansion, it doesn't have a video out for it, which would add to the weight and the cost. Um, and it doesn't have, check me, does it have an Ethernet connection? Yeah. Uh, so you need a dongle for that. So it, it does have two USB ports, which and they're USB. Uh, the other thing is, you need, speaking of dongles, you need one of these things, like for 20 bucks. If um, this is this connects to the serial thing that John just sh showed you, and then unless you've got a serial port on your computer, which once upon a time you probably all did, but uh, it, then it connects it to a USB thing. So again, Amazon, this is a trend net USB to serial converter, 18 bucks, 20 bucks. Questions? You know if anybody's done an add-on battery pack for that? It's awfully lightweight on wattage. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know who makes their batteries, to be honest with you. I don't know where the batteries uh, I mean, even for the smart uh, top. Yeah. It seems that uh, there'd be a market there for somebody to just do a, a plug-in battery pack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that Kurt knows I, I had done with the Attaboard, I actually got the Attaboard running with a bunch of, a pack of uh, Double A batteries, you know. <laughs> so, so, and that was a challenge because that was probably three or four times the the wattage of, of these boxes. Uh, and that, I, you know, I could run that thing for half an hour. So, how many Shiva plugs that we have just on a car battery? Uh, the, the other thing that we had done collectively as a group uh, was we got these things running on solar panels, which actually is another application that I was earlier specifically interested in. Which is how do you stick these things out in the environment? Run it off of uh, a solar panel and uh, and do something useful with it. it, it at, at 30 watts, that's really just too hard to do. I, Kurt, I don't know at what point does it become more feasible, but we're getting close. Yeah, and these are single volt boards. That's one of the good things. Is, uh, you know, when with your atom boards, it was 12 yeah. volts and 5 volts, so that really complicated things. These are. I'm pretty sure this is just a 5 volt wall board that goes into the smart top. Right. Good. Anything else? Uh, all once, twice? I got one quick question. Yep. Um, so I was hoping this was, was going to be my Netflix streaming box, and it, it, it's not doing that. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably because there's no GPU on it or no. Um, so, what was? Have you had these experiences with you know putting something Net TV kind of thing on it, or I, you, you use like a Google TV or something? I have an Apple TV, ninety nine dollars, and uh, you know I, I think that. The, the, it's it's definitely not uh, as as we talked about for you know it's not a video playback machine. Uh, Intel has just introduced this chip where they claim it's going to pump out HD video. You know you put one of those in a box like this, and I think you get your Netflix Nirvana. But uh, do, I mean, how many people watch Netflix over the over their Ethernet connection at home? How do people do kind of you know TVs built in TVs? Sony, uh, Sony DVD player. Media. Sony network media player. Sony, so so. Coco box. Coco box, right? So there are boxes. Or there are. Uh, I mean, the Roku box is cheaper than that. So why would you bother going to all the work to try to get this to do that? Plus well, the, the DRM for Netflix doesn't support that. So right. Uh, well, I, I, so I was kind of tricked by having that HDMI connector. Yeah, the, the beauty, I think, of the HDMI, HDMI connector would be, for instance, another application, kiosks, uh, signage management, mm -hmm. in-store displays, you're a little local realtor and you want to, you know, have, you want to have your thing, you know, that, that shows all the new listings. You know, you could hire somebody to, you know, to do this kind of stuff or you could do it yourself real quick. So loads, I think there are loads of potential applications. Any other questions? Go once, twice before Jerry gives me the hook. Okay. Thank you very much. Brian, thank you very much.